Welcome, Topsy Kola Oyeni. Thank you so much. Oops. Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. Um, just making sure the mic is working. The presentation. Just checking a few quick logistics. Okay, while, the, while that's happening, good morning everyone. Um, it's a great privilege to be here this morning um, for me and a great privilege to have you present because you didn't have to wake up this morning to be here on Workers' Day. So thank you for being here. Um, first of all, I would like to say a very big thank you um, to Pastor Quadru and Pastor Tony for the privilege of being on this platform. Um, I've been a big follower of platform, you know, and I truly believe that it's the premier forum for idea exchange around Nigeria's holistic development. And I say holistic development because there are a number of different platforms where you can speak about economic development or policies. But I think platform is unique because it considers um, Nigeria's development from a wide range of angles, everything from economic development to social change to values um, and to policy transformation. So it's, it's truly a great privilege. I think beyond that also, I am, I've been greatly blessed um, and I'm a great beneficiary of the ministry of Pastor Kodro and Pastor Tony, and I'm really grateful um, to be here this morning. All right, this morning, um, you know, I have the privilege of, you know, sharing a few thoughts on the concept of wealth builders, specifically around women in business and women in technology. And we're going to explore a few things um, around this topic. But I'd like to first start off, um, you know, with sharing with you sort of like the key premise of my conversation, all right? Um, and I'd like you to pay attention because it might be a bit jarring at first but then I'll hopefully lead us to a proper conclusion. All right, let's make sure we're good to go. All right. <clears throat> so, in this decade, there are three things that I can guarantee will happen. And not because I'm a prophet, but because the facts also support it, and they are predictable. What are those three things? One. Power will change hands. And what do we mean by power will change hands? That is the, the people in places of influence will transition. And they'll transition just by fact of nature. We're in a phase where a certain generation is growing older. Some of you might have heard of the concept of the great wealth transfer. And the great wealth transfer is basically speaking of the baby boomer generation as they transition. And what happens to their wealth and how is that going to be managed? So power will change hands in this decade. Two, new wealth will be created in this decade. Um, new wealth from different sectors, sectors that did not exist before. If you've been paying attention to what's been happening with arti artificial intelligence and not just the chat GPT angle that we all use, but the implications in terms of the stock markets and what companies that are powered by artificial intelligence are doing, you will see that returns that haven't been heard of are being generated hundreds of percentages in few months. That is the sort of wealth that will be created in this decade. And then thirdly, mantles will be given. And when we talk about mantles, I'm speaking about leadership mantles. New leadership mantles will be transitioned in this decade. If you're familiar with finance, there's a gentleman called Jamie Dimon. He's known as the king of banking. When he speaks globally, everyone in banking pays attention. He sets the pace, he sets direction. Jamie Dimon is 68. JP Morgan is already planning around his succession. What that means is that there will be a new king, quote unquote, or queen of banking, right? So I want you to pay attention to these three concepts because it shapes everything else we're going to be discussing around wealth building and the opportunities that are present to us in this, in this time and season. I think the key question for us is that, will you be positioned to recognize, seize, and make the most of the opportunities being presented? Now, when we talk about wealth building, I, am, I would love to set the context. I am an unrepentant um, 
believer in the power of digital innovation, in the power of policy innovation, and in the power of young people, those different factors coming together to drive economic development. Um, and I, I'm a believer in it because I've experienced it practically. Um, it's not a theoretical concept. It's something that I've lived and I've experienced. And I'll use the example of cashless Lagos to bring it to life a bit. Um, in one decade, we have seen the Nigerian payment sector go from, that's in about 10 years, from 2012 to about where we are now. So 10, 12 years, we've seen the Nigerian payment sector grow exponentially. Grow exponentially driven by policy design, intentional policy design led by the um, former central bank governor, um, driven by the infrastructure that was put in place that led payments to increase in transaction volumes over 50% year on year, even post COVID still growing at that pace. And then the multiplier effect that the proper payments infrastructure enabled, the entire FinTech boom, interfacing with other trends of technology, cloud technology, different factors that led to new business models like e-commerce being possible, riding on that payments infrastructure, digital lending, and a host of other things. What is the point that I'm trying to get across is that it is possible in a decade to actually see transformation. It is possible in a decade to start small and to actually see it scale. And so if you are a young person or if you are a woman and you are looking in this season of opportunity, it's not something that you have to think is 20 years out. It's possible in the next 10 years for you to see that sort of impact. <clears throat> But let's start first with sort of the state of play. Maybe just trying to make sure I have an eye on the timer. Ah, okay, <laughs> I've seen, make sure I don't run over time. All right, let's start with the state of play with women in business and women in technology, okay? Um, on the chart on the left-hand side, basically, you see a graph that shows women representation in big tech. Um, you'd see that, you know, women in terms of the population, just based on that chart, 47%. But representation in big tech, and that's like all the big tech companies we know, Amazon, Google, Facebook, these are all the guys that are setting the agenda for technology. Women representation in those institu institutions, are on, women are underrepresented. I think that's the first thing. Apart from maybe Amazon, which you can see sort of like a good percentage of the workforce are women. When you look at the leadership positions and you look at the women in tech jobs, even more so in terms of underrepresentation, now, why is this important? This is not just about, oh, you know, women should be present everywhere, no. We did a survey sometime in, I think, 2020 when we were doing a FinTech assessment um, of Nigeria's FinTech industry. And we interviewed women to understand sort of the rate of adoption of payment solutions. And what we discovered is that even though payment solutions were being widely adopted, within segments, within female segments, the rate of adoption was much lower. Why was that the case? because the solutions were, that were being created didn't really factor female needs into the solution. And this is why women need to be represented in technology where it counts to shape the type of solutions that will be relevant for women and that would ensure female digital inclusion. So that's the first thing. If you're you know, you a woman in this, in this place and you're thinking about technology and you have an interest, you should by all means get into that space, not just in terms of managerial roles or just in terms of being in the business, but also in technology roles where you actually shape products and solutions that are relevant. Now, if we flip onto the side of women in business, <clears throat> the first thing to note is that in Africa and in Nigeria, the, 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 the trend holds the same. Majority of our businesses are SMEs, right? About 83% or so of the economy are made up of SMEs. And a significant portion of those SMEs are informal. Now, when you look at women in business, if we're talking about wealth building, it's not just about having women in business, but it's about having women in businesses that are driving innovation. What do I mean? On the chart, you see a figure of 51%. It's an illustration, but it's a figure from Uganda that says 51% of female-owned businesses are necessity-driven and not innovation-driven. Necessity-driven means that those businesses were set up to meet basic needs. Those businesses were set up as a means of necessity for taking care of the family or taking care of the woman or her children and so on and so forth, and not around solving 
big problems or not around necessarily driving value creation. Now, why is this distinction important? Necessity-driven businesses are great, but for us to build wealth, it has to be innovation-driven businesses. Those are the kind of businesses that scale. Those are the kind of businesses that get funding. Those are the kind of businesses that can actually contribute to wealth creation. So when we look at our state of play, yes, we're in the space, we're in technology, yes, we're in business, but a lot of our businesses are still informal, a lot of our businesses are still focused on managing or meeting our own needs, and we need to shift into that realm of wealth creation by driving innovation. All right, so given all of that context, right, the question becomes, all right, so we know that it's a season of opportunity, a lot of transition, will occur, but how does that play out in terms of you know, what you should be doing, right? How does that play out in terms of maybe the skills that you should develop? Now, when you look at this chart, you, you see three totally different pictures, or seemingly different pictures. Um, and big shout out to Tunde Onokoya, who's done amazing things and made Nigeria proud, right? Um, I just had to find a way to put this picture in there. So let's, 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 celebrate, let's celebrate Tunde. Um, but yeah, three seemingly different pictures, but let's, let's what, what do these three things have in common? Pattern recognition, patterns, and I'll explain. In the game of chess, chess is widely considered a game of strategy. I mean, you think about chess, you think about strategy. And it is said that very good chess players can look at a chess board, and from that chess board, they can tell you who is winning just by looking at the chess board, and they can tell you what moves either player should make, right? How do they do that? They master pattern recognition. They master sort of looking at the entire chessboard, looking at the model and saying, okay, these are the likely things or the outputs that will come. If you move here, this happens. Pattern recognition in strategy. What does patterns have to do with dialab or adire and creativity? In fashion design, you eliminate waste, you ensure replication, accuracy through patterns. You use patterns to improve your efficiency. And so patterns are very important in fashion design. And I'll say patterns are very important in the process of creativity as well. And then last but not least, in technology, we've all, I mean, I'm sure many of us here use ChatGPT, or at least we've heard about ChatGPT. But artificial intelligence, which is basically what the technology that ChatGPT is based on, is based on pattern recognition to learn. The reason that ChatGPT can, can take tons of data and give you answers on the fly is that it has been trained on pattern recognition using data. And this is the same principle that we as humans, so artificial intelligence mimics human beings by pattern recognition, absorbing large, information, large amounts of information and then translating that to predict patterns and provide responses. And in this decade, where things are moving very fast, where change is happening at rocket speed, we need that ability to recognize patterns. We need the ability to identify them, recognize them, and act on patterns. And I'll give us an illustration on how we can do that. So let's take a walk down memory lane. Um, you know, during COVID-19, which you know, seems so far away, during COVID-19, everyone felt like the world was going to change forever, no one would travel again, there'll be no more events, hybrid will be, I mean, no, virtual events will be the thing and all, but now life has gone on, human beings, we've, we've moved on and we snapped back to reality. But during COVID-19, I spent quite a bit of time, because I had a bit of time on my hands, I spent quite a bit of time studying what happened in the last similar event, so the Spanish flu of 1914. And there were so many lessons that I pulled out, again, in the spirit of pattern recognition. What did I discover? <clears throat> so during 1914, 1914 was when the Spanish flu happened and it extended for a bit of time. There was also World War I and all of that. But after that, after the Spanish flu ended, you know, however you might say it ended, there was a bit of a recession, just very similar to what we've also experienced with COVID. And then the roaring 20s, the decade of tremendous wealth creation. It was like a wealth boom. Everything was just, everything was firing on all cylinders. I mean, a couple of years later, in 1928, there was the Great Depression, but that's another, that's another story. But today we focus on what happened in that wealth, in that decade of wealth creation. Now, what you discover was that there were three elements that were playing, um, three factors that were interplaying to create this 
um, 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 this wealth boom, so to speak. First, it was the base of it was technology, technology innovation. And the technology innovation in that time was assembly line production. Assembly line production, which gave birth to the Ford Model T, which is a picture of what you see on the left, and is one of the best symbols of the wealth creation that was done in that season. And so the assembly line production, but also, um, also catalyzed by economic policies that enabled credit um, you know, for consumers, um, also catalyzed by geopolitical shifts that were occurring in that time, you know, post-World War I, and all of that. All those factors led to create sort of that boom. And the question for us is that when you look at what's happening now or what happened after COVID-19, the similar, if you look at the pattern, the pattern in terms of the technology that will drive that change for us is going to be artificial intelligence. In that society, manufacturing was the core base of what was happening in that time. And the innovation of assembly line production was around manufacturing. In our society, knowledge is, a, is, is the core base of our economy. And artificial intelligence is the innovation on our knowledge economy that is going to enable mass production. Let's look at it a bit further. When you take what happened then in terms of this Ford Model T and what were the factors driving it, you see elements of technology, like I mentioned, the assembly line technology enabled cost of the car to go to like from 30% of what it cost to produce previously. That was one factor. Electricity was also another factor. You could call it technology, but the, the um, um, scaling of electricity was also important because it enabled new electrical devices to be created. It created a market for devices that didn't exist before, radios, fridge, things like that. And those things now had an impact on family life and living because now you could cook and store food in the fridge, and that created new flexibility also for women and for what women were able to do. Um, I mentioned things around purchasing power, mass advertising, which could be uh, um, um, a proxy for distribution, mass distribution. So today, our own mass distribution is the internet. Anywhere you set up, you're able to do business leveraging the internet, leveraging that form of communication. But the Ford Model T was not just the only story, it was the catalyst it created a number of different businesses and spillovers from the Ford Model T, right? Um, it created, you know, parts, part business. So now tires and all that needed to be created. Car dealerships were now created. Now that everyone could afford a car, people started making big investments in highway, highway construction. People could now live further out because, you know, there were, there were highways, they could afford a car, and so on and so forth. Hotels, tourism, all of these different things grew. Right? So something catalyzed it, but it led to a spill off of so many other things. So now let's come back to where we are now, right? When we think about what we're discussing here today, wealth building, the first question that might be on your mind is where are the opportunities today? Okay? Now, I believe that Africa, and specifically Nigeria, we are rich in the elements of wealth production but not wealth production from an economic standpoint, per se. In economics, the factors of wealth production are things like land, capital, business, and all of that. But from the perspective of disruptive innovation, Nigeria and Africa at large, we are very, we are very ripe for it. And what do I mean? One is, number one, we have a very young population. 40% of our population is under 15. Um, that's compared to 25% for the rest of the world on average, right? So you have a young population that will be willing to adopt digital solutions. By the way, they haven't really known, quote unquote, better. So if that's the way it's done, that's the new way that it's done. That's the first thing. The second thing is that in terms of gender parity, and gender parity re speaks to the, um, the effort to ensure that women are, are placed on an equal footing in terms of opportunity and access across different areas of society as, as, as men. In terms of gender parity, because of where we rank now as a continent, where women, <clears throat> in terms of equality in society, don't have a great standing, there is potential in terms of GDP uplift of about 10% or so, if we're able to improve that. So from that sense as well, from getting women more economically involved in driving businesses, in creating value, we actually have a spillover effect on the economy itself. And then third, last but not least, is that we are first or second 
unfortunately from the bottom. You know, we are first or second from the bottom in every sector on this continent from a productivity level. What that means is that there's significant opportunity everywhere to drive innovation, to drive improvement, right? And so these different factors actually create um, an opportunity for significant innovation across board. So that's the first thing for us to recognize around the opportunities. Now, how do you search for these opportunities? And this is more for illustration. It's not exhaustive, it's not, but it's just to share sort of the concept of how you start saying, okay, given that we know we're in a season of opportunity, how do I start to identify where some of these opportunities might fall? And there are a couple of different dimensions you consider. And when you consider those dimensions, you map out what are the trends that you are seeing, but not just the trends or just the events. You then have to spend time to reflect to see what could be the implications of these trends. I think it was last year or the year before during the Ukraine-Russia conflict that you know, we didn't think was part of our concern, but we realized that grains and the cost of bread in Nigeria was impacted by you know, what was happening in Ukraine, right? So you take each of these areas, you look at geopolitics, what's happening, Israel and Hamas war, how does that impact, um, <clears throat> how does that impact supply chain disruptions? Um, US and China are having tensions, what does that mean? What is my backup strategy for my business in terms of my supply chain strategy? Or I'm, maybe I'm receiving funding from the US government because I do donor-based work, and the US government is having you know, um, rifts with China, how does that affect what I do? So it's that process of thinking through what are these different things and how do I position? Environment is another area that's extremely important. And it's one area where there's also a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, we've seen, for example, what has happened this year, even in our own space with, with, with the climate change, right? I mean, if you didn't believe in climate change before, and you've been in Lagos, I don't know how it is in the rest of Nigeria at the moment, but the level of heat this year does not have part two. Do you understand? And some of those things have implications on farming. It has implications on food production. I mean, the, the president initially um, had declared a food state of emergency. That's serious business. So then the question you ask yourself is that this climate thing is not going away. What if it gets worse next year? What does that mean in terms of the prospects in the agricultural value chain? OK, agriculture is going to be very important. Where do I play in that value chain? And those are the kind of questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Um, Now, <clears throat> I truly believe that women are uniquely positioned in this time of opportunity. And if, if this is the only thing you get out of it, please get it, because you know everything happens in times and seasons. Seasons do not last forever. They flip. There's a new flavor of the month. Things change. Priorities change. For example, after COVID, a lot of the donor funding shifted to healthcare because that was their priority, right? So things change. But at this particular time, I believe women are uniquely positioned on two dimensions. We're uniquely positioned as beneficiaries of some of these changes and some of these policies, and we're also uniquely positioned to drive some of these things, and I'll explain. So on the first dimension, we have the sustainable development goals, and we have you know, the whole discussions around diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? These are things that we have to take advantage of. The entire world is focused, even if it's just for lip service. People have to think through their diversity and their you know, equality strategy and all of the rest, right? People have to think about, okay, what program do I have that supports women, right? I hope you know that because of the whole emphasis on sustainability and ESG, ESG, Environmental Sustainability Goals, there's a lot of finance that's linked to your ability to demonstrate that you are actually um, embedding these sustainability principles. So even if it's just for purposes of ticking the box, you have to understand that these opportunities are available. They will not always be available, and you have to say, how do I key into them? How do I understand what is required, and how do I position myself? Very important. Then the second thing is workforce trends. Something that's not often spoken about is that part of the reason women are not necessarily engaged in the workforce, or that a lot of women have disruptions in their career, is because we face barriers. And depending on you know, your situation and the support structure you have, you might have to choose between whether you should work or whether you should take care of your children. You know, and it might be about the economics. Listen, how much am I getting from this job? I have to pay someone by the time I get back, and so many other logistics. Those are some of the things that, that restrict us from participating in the economy. But the workforce trends are in our favor. The tide of trends are, are in our favor. Why? Number one, flexibility. 
The whole thing, if COVID, if that's all COVID left us, this concept of flexibility is extremely important. Now people expect that, listen, there should be some form of flexible work. People know that, listen, you don't necessarily need somebody in the office to get work done. So flexibility is in our favor. But the other thing that's also in our favor, because I also believe that women need to play to their strengths. You know, I've been a woman that I've typically, now I'm older, so I'm no longer the, the youngest in the, ro the room, but I was typically the youngest in the room. I was typically the only female or one of few females, right? But one thing that I feel like most women have as a natural gift is the ability to collaborate. You know, this issue of ego is not as prominent in, in women, right? And that is a skill that's required now, a skill that's required to bring people together, to drive alignment and all the rest. So I feel that as women, we should leverage on these trends not to act like what we are not, but to play to our own strengths, to be fully woman in your own space and leverage on, on your strengths. And then last but not least is growth sectors. And what do I mean by growth sectors? There are some sectors that are positioned to um, benefit significantly from new technologies, from technological innovation. Healthcare is one, right? Especially in a country like Nigeria or in most of Africa where we don't have an existing healthcare infrastructure. The ability to leverage digital, the ability to leverage artificial intelligence to provide healthcare service will be sort of almost like a leapfrog. You know how we didn't have fixed wireline phones and we had to innovate on mobile? It's the same way in healthcare and in education. We're going to have to innovate leveraging new technologies. But that provides an opportunity for women, one, because those are the sectors that impact women negatively the most. So in healthcare, you have things like maternal, um, um, maternal deaths and mortality rates. You have you know, um, planning, um, um, family planning, and things like that, that impact not just the woman and her ability to engage, but also in terms of impacting the overall economy and our productivity levels when we can't control our population growth. And education, girl-child girl education, right? The constraints around that perhaps could be managed by technology. So number one, in these sectors we are present, Number two, in these sectors, we are impacted. And number three, these sectors also allow us, also remove some of the barriers that allow us to participate. So what is my message here is that, you know, we are uniquely positioned. We will not be uniquely positioned forever. We need to take advantage of these opportunities and build on it. Okay. Oops. All right, so in closing, as I, as I wrap up, um, I want to summarize my perspective on wealth building and wealth creation. I think wealth building, you know, wealth building is, is very different from creating personal wealth for yourself. You can create personal wealth for yourself, but when we talk about wealth building, according to the theme of this conference, it's not about what you and your family can manage. It's about creating national wealth. It's about creating skill. It's about adding value. And I believe there are four things that we can do, um, you know, now to take advantage of that. We need to activate and incentivize and encourage female participation. Because when we have more women participating in the economy, we actually increase our productivity, we reduce our, our, our birth rates and things like that. So that's one. Two is that we need the right policy enablers. I shared what I started with around cashless because of what I have seen in a short time by right policy facilitating change and driving change in, 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 in our economy. Two is that we need to be very focused on productivity, strategically. I mean, across all sectors, there are challenges. But three sectors, I believe, if we pay attention to, will facilitate a lot of growth. Energy, health, and education. And these three factors affect women a lot. And so if you are a woman also, those are some sectors to look into to say, what are the opportunities if you are passionate about things in that area? And then lastly, we need to think about market-creating innovations. And market-creating innovations is really about how do we how do we create solutions that are affordable and accessible that turn people who are non-consumers into consumers? That is, they are non-consumers not because they don't want the solution, but because they can't afford it. And for example, that is the challenge we face today with solar energy. Solar energy, great innovation. We, cook, we don't even have power in Nigeria, and it's a real challenge. And now we're going into band A and band B and C and D, right? So solar energy is a great opportunity, but it has not yet been constructed in a way that makes it affordable for people to become consumers. So as I wrap up, <clears throat> I wanted to leave you with some questions. Number one, what shifts are you seeing? Number two, what are the patterns that are emerging? 
And then number three, what will you do about it? And I have a few thoughts on what you can do about it. I think number one, you need to prepare. If that's the only thing that I can get across is that you need to prepare. Opportunities are coming, you need to prepare. Number two is you need to um, acquire knowledge or skills in your area of interest. And generally speaking, you need to develop your pattern recognition skills. So that's something that, that we spoke about. Thirdly, you need to um, double down on a shift. Pick a shift. Pick one of these shifts that you're seeing. If it's in the healthcare space, if it's in whatever space, pick that shift and focus on building your knowledge and intelligence in that shift and decide where in that value chain you are going to play. Healthcare is big. Where exactly in healthcare are you going to play? What specific solution, what specific service? And then lastly, act. A lot of times why women don't um, get involved is that we're afraid to act. We're afraid to do it afraid. But the truth is that nobody ever knew, nobody ever did what they did before. It, it took one day for us to all do it. So with that, I'll wrap up and say thank you so much um, for having me. I hope I've left you with a few reflections on wealth building. Thank you.